Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our first council briefing of the seventh summit on the global agenda. My pleasure to welcome you here. My name is Oliver Kahn. I'm the uh, Director of Media Relations at the World Economic Forum. Don't be put off by the formality. We only have a press conference room, so we actually conceived uh, the idea of council briefings more as round tables, informal briefings for you to access some of the world-class thought leadership we have here at the summit over the, uh, over the coming three days. We chose what we hoped are subjects of interest uh, to local, regional, and international media, and also subjects where we have you know, a vast and deep um, knowledge and, and, and base of expertise here within the summit itself. So this one is about future, future cities. I'm very proud to be joined by two leading experts who can give different takes on their vision for um, cities in the future. To my left here, Imad El Haj, who's Associate Professor, American University of Beirut in Lebanon, and a member of our Global Agenda Council on Artificial Intelligence and Robotics. And to my, my far left, Anil Menon, who is President, Smart Connected Communities and Deputy Chief Globalization Officer, Cisco Systems in India, and a Global Agenda Council member on Future of Smart Cities. So I'm going to ask both my uh, panelists here just to give you a, a brief overview of their vision for cities of the future. Anil will be talking on the role of city services and Imad will talk a, a little bit about the role of future technologies and emerging technology and how they will shape cities. And then feel free to chip in with questions. Thanks very much. I'd like to, Anil, if you could perhaps start. Sure, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Thank you all. Uh, let me, let me. Yes. It's, Yes, if you put it on. Is it uh, being translated? There's no translation? We have no translation here. Oh, that's a problem. Yeah, I know. OK. What do we do? Can, can somebody get some translation in this room, please? OK, we're working on it. Um, if you bear with Why me. Why don't I can translate? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Back out of it. OK, thanks. Sir. Sorry, thanks for bearing with us. This is our first session of the day. They should arrive shortly. Uh, Anil. Do you, do you want to go first and then I speak? Sure. Yeah. You want to okay. yeah, switch the fine. order? Uh, so can we just have a quick show of hands? How many, how many Arabic speakers are we here? Because if okay. So I think we just go ahead in English and then we'll try to, maybe perhaps if, if uh, Imad, if you could just summarize a few of, of Anil's points in Arabic. So I don't want to ruin the flow of the session. Hopefully our translators will have arrived. Please accept our apologies. Thank you. Um, the entire area of smart cities uh, is becoming a global thing. And the reason for that are essentially three dynamics. One is the macroeconomic demographics. Saudi Arabia, UAE, India, Indonesia are getting larger and younger. European countries are getting smaller and older. So how are they going to be able to continue to give standard of living and manage cities? They have to rethink the entire way cities are built. Second one is with the entire digital technologies that are there, cities will be run differently. So transportation will be different if you have smart connected things. So the whole idea is as we become more and more connected using digital technologies in your smartphones, and your electric lights being connected. Let's take this building. You've got 75 to 85 protocols in a building that is new and fantastic as this. The lights, the elevators, the electricity, the networks, they don't talk to each other. So you have inefficiency of energy of about 30 to 40%. By connecting these, you can create 30 to 40% of energy efficiencies in a building. That is what smart buildings using technology comes in. But the third thing that is even more interesting, and this is where Dubai is leading, in my opinion, the world, is how will you manage the city functions in a way that is cost effective? Increasingly, cities will look for public-private partnerships, and they will look for revenue-generating approaches. And Dubai, which has already got each of its function, has to be profitable and manage it themselves. The business models from Dubai will become now, I think, stolen and studied in other parts of the world. So I think I'm going to stop there. But this is, this is the reason why, for example, my company, Cisco, which co-leads an industry coalition for the Internet of Things World Forum, 
Our first one was Barcelona. The second meeting that ended last month was Chicago. Next year, the forum is going to be here in Dubai. And the reason for that is because I think the new lessons for how cities are going to be run will come from emerging countries, along with, obviously, lessons from the US and UK and Germany and Copenhagen and France. I'm not suggesting that those lessons are not relevant, but how we run cities will be very different in Indonesia and in India and in Mexico and the others because they have to have a different model. Thanks. Imad, over to you. Okay. Um, I'll be a bit more academic in my discussion and uh, what we're interested in in Artificial Intelligence and Robotics Council is what is the role of artificial intelligence and robotics in the future of cities. Not only how they're managed and run, but also how they are constructed. We're talking about things like 3D printing of a building. You get a robot on a scaffold though, and it just pumps the concrete and, and the structure is up there. And what is the implication of that on the economy of construction? What is the impact of that on the conservation of the resources and the environmental impact on a construction site? Uh, in addition to this, uh, in the context of the future cities, the question of health management and epidemic control, informing, and containment, how is that will be conducted and what is the role of technology in doing that? Particularly that when we talk about large cities in the future of cities context, this is an exponential problem. If you have a million people, it is much, much more difficult to manage when you have a thousand people. And the question of health implications becomes very critical and what is the role that technology would play on that? We see that that is a critical role. Add to this the issue of aging communities. Um, what is the role of robotics in aiding uh, aging uh, population? Uh, other examples I could see is in security administration. How do we monitor? How do we contain events, events whether they are man-made or natural disasters. How do we respond in such big environments? Uh, we have little experience, particularly that in many cases, we're not fortunate as in Dubai, things are not being planned ahead of time. The growth that is occurring with time is not planned. These are events and projects that come based on economic planning and not based on regional impact and the impact on the communities that are, they're being shaped with these cities. The way we see it, we see the future cities being augmented cities, where you would have your devices or your glasses actually becoming your eye, not into the city only, but into information of the city, into the history of the city. And that is a big added uh, feature that we see a big uh, part for technology uh, in it. However, the concern ultimately uh, is not the technology and its role, but how could we maintain the human factor within all this technology? And we already see a departure in uh, social implications that we have. We are more connected, but yet probably socially more disconnected. Thank you. Thanks very much, and a warm welcome to our translators who have just joined us. Just to recap, um, uh, for the benefits of those listening um, through translation, Anil um, was, was, was expanding upon the, um, the role and, and the, the likely primacy of emerging market cities um, in, in driving next generation of future city development. Fascinating subjects, uh, a very wide area in the true spirit of uh, this briefing. I encourage you all to ask questions. Do we have anyone who uh, wants to ask any questions? I'm going to ask one myself. But no, Francis, your hand was wavering, so I'm going to give the mic over to you. I'd like to ask Anil if he can explain a bit more about what you were saying about the, the business models in Dubai to be studied and how a, a city which is developing um, public services, I mean, how much, how much is a city administration based on public services and infrastructure and should they be revenue generating? Yeah. So um, if you don't mind, I'm just going to put a little context to the point that I made. If you think about today, uh, urbanization is probably one of the big Global Agenda Council focus because it's a big serious problem worldwide. And if you look at um, 180,000 people are moving from rural areas into cities every day worldwide. That means you have to create a new London or a new San Francisco every month for the next 20 years. 
That's the scale we're talking about. So when you have to create a London or a San Francisco every month, month after month for the next 20 years, you have to do things differently because you don't have the time nor the scale capability of doing it, which is where you have to think globally. That's the first point. Second one is I want to pick up on what the professor said, which is if you think about traffic, you can't come in and say, how do I solve for the traffic problems of Chicago or London the old way? So you ask a different question, why is there traffic? And research shows that between the hours of four and seven in London, in New York, in Chicago, Los Angeles, and in Paris, the bulk of the traffic, 50 to 60% of traffic, are people looking for parking spaces. That's what it is. The fact is that adds to a carbon footprint. It creates traffic jam. So the point is, if you could sensorize all the parking spaces, put it in an open data platform, and create a new business model around it, where somebody who's in a hurry says, if I get a parking space closest to where I have to go, I'm willing to pay this amount of dollars, you create a new source of revenue for the city. Parking today is number two or number three source of revenue for most large cities after the tax construct. Second example, healthcare, the future of healthcare, which is breaking many countries. But do you realize that for most people, everyone in this room, you don't know whether you're healthier today than you were yesterday. You don't know whether what you ate this morning is making you healthier. The only thing you have is that scale. Yet for heart attacks, which is a big issue in most emerging countries and many places around this region, the first symptom of a heart attack for 50% of the people, do you know what that is? Death. For 50% it's death. Yet heart attack is one disease that gives you a signal hours before you're dying. So now if you put sensors that monitors your body physiology, it can actually send some message to your smartphone that sends a doctor that this person is gonna have a cardiac arrest. That requires a different business model, not the a traditional public health. So this point I was making about new services is that governments cannot afford to build these models on their own. Some of the things they would have to do, but to create this at a global scale, you will need public-private partnerships with governments and private companies creating new businesses around healthcare, traffic management, water management, and the others. Does that, I'm, I'm sorry, it's, it's a much more detail, but hopefully that helps. I, I, if I may, I'm going to exercise my right to ask a question too. Apologies, everybody. And what's the most exciting or the most, uh, the most uh, visionary, viable business model you've seen in your, in your, in your work in this field? So I know we're at a early, very early stage. I, I'm sorry? Well, I, I'm, I know we're at a very early stage. But yeah, and that's, that's why I hesitated for a second. Everybody has been experimenting, and some of us have not quite figured out how to make a Uber work into the current business model of a city, for example, or an Airbnb. The fact of the matter is we don't know whether the future will look the same, mm -hmm. but the fact is those on the edges mm -hmm. are where all these innovations are coming from. I'll give you a simple example. I mean, that's why I've always been very appreciative of what Dubai has done, because a city state that does not have oil has transformed itself by looking at things differently from a business model and services point of view. So not everything can be complied in America or Europe from Dubai, but some lessons on parking management, which is being done here, we could apply elsewhere. And so I don't believe there's a single innovation anywhere, whether it's the one in Ankara or in Istanbul, where they have semi created a semi self-governing water management company so that the city gets it from a, not a private company, it's not a public company. It's a very different structure. In India with the Delhi-Mumbai corridor, where they're creating a self-governing body. I think you're seeing a lot of examples, and that is where the council's work becomes important, to look for best practice from across the world, meta council to bring best ideas together, because this is what the country and the world needs today, is new business models on how to do it. Very interesting, and we've got uh, two people uh, asking questions. So yes, gentleman in the front row first, followed by the lady in the third row. Could you just uh, also uh, mention your name and your affiliation, please? Abdullah Bahagag, Mr. Sultan of Oman, greeted the Lotan. You want to It's going to be in Arabic. Abdullah Bahagag, Mr. Sultan of Oman, greeted the Lotan. I have a feeling that the Yambere and Yoko Bain and Etibar, the Ainu Mudu Gidid, the Yambere and Yoko Bain and the Yambere and Yoko هل السؤال الاستراتيجي اللي بغان يطرح هنا على الأجندة المعنية بهذا الأمر بالمدن التحدي الأكبر في اعتقاد الشخص اللي بيواجه العالم هو التحدي المدن هذا حقيقة 
هل المجتمع الذهنية المجتمعية الآن على استعداد أن تساهم أن تقبل الخدمات المدفوعة الثمن الذهنية الخليجية على وجه التحديد تعتمد على الدولة في تقديم الخدمات المجانية بصورة مطلقة إلى حد بعيد كيف نقدر نستطيع أن نغير ذهنية هؤلاء الناس في المقام الأول لكي يقبل هذه الشراكة بين الحكومة والقطاع الخاص ولكي أيضا يدفعوا مقابل الخدمات التي تقدم لهم وشكرا I think that's uh, yeah, it's possibly a question for Imad to Allow start with. Allow me to start. At, uh, بلش بلك إنه ب بدبي وعموما دول الخليج يمكن محظوظين إنه المشكلة هي إذا الشعب قابل يدفع أو ما يدفع للخدمات. بعتقد المشكلة الأكبر بالدول اللي هي الخدمات مش موجودة. والمشكلة هي كيف بدي يقدر المجتمع المدني يعود عن هالنقص اللي الدول ما عم بتغطيه. وكثير مهم لنا بس نطلع على التكنولوجي بس نطلع على التطور العلمي اللي عم بيصير نقدر نطلع عليه بمنظار ايكواليتي مساواه هل هالتكنولوجي بتزبط بدبي مثل ما بتزبط بغير دول ما لنا محظوظه قد دبي اكيد بدنا نكون واقعيين انه البزنس امبليكيشنز مهمين كثير لنا وهل قادرين نعمل مصاري او ما نعمل مصاري من التكنولوجي بتلعب دور كبير فيها ولكن اذا ما نحكي بتطور الانسانيه عموما علينا واجب وقت نحكي عن التكنولوجيا وعن تطور تكنولوجي انه نطلع ونقدر نعمل هالتكنولوجيا بطريقه يكون فيها عداله اجتماعيه ومساواه وما تكون هذه التكنولوجيا بس للي قادر يدفع او ما يدفع او قادر حكومته تعطيها او ما تعطيها هذا تشالنج لنا من التكنولوجي بالبزنس يمكن عندهم منظار غير بيكون Thank you. I know you have anything to mention. Yeah, no, I I want to um, no, I totally agree with not only with what you're saying but also with what professor just said. Um, let me take this at two levels. One is I think at the end of the day cities and people who are working on smart cities, if they forget this, they will never get there. That is, cities are about the people and it's about the soul of the city. If you lose the soul of the city and the soul of the country, this technology will never ever work. So that's the first, and I always say that smart cities is not about technology. At the end of the day, technology is only an enabler. It has to enable something that is important, which is social sustainability, economic sustainability, and environmental sustainability. You have to think of all three. Having economic sustainability without the social cohesion, and especially on the inclusive growth, is an extraordinarily important one. I'll give you a simple example. In a country where I'm sitting currently, which is where our global headquarters is India, 1.2 billion people, the average age, the 60% of India is age 27. In 30 years, the 60% of India will be the age of 24. It's getting larger and younger. But 600 million children don't have access to healthcare, education, and jobs. This is a dangerous, dangerous situation for any country. Forget about India. So that is an extraordinarily important point. This is how do you get access? Now I want to connect the point that the professor made. Tanzania, it's a country of, it's a country of 43 million people. Highest birth rate and the highest infant mortality for heart disease, for cardiac issues. 150,000 babies die of a heart condition. In the whole country, there's no single pediatric surgeon, no pediatric pulmonologist, no pediatric radiologist. How do you solve for that problem? So what we have done is created a network of doctors in India with the doctors, primary doctors in Tanzania, connected on the network and doing everything remotely and helping the local doctors. So sometimes you can't solve for within a country, so you have to look at inter-country, inter-city collaboration using the digital network for taking services into remote areas, into poorer sections of a city, into poorer parts of the country, along with all the other things that you have to do to make it affordable. You have to make healthcare, education, and jobs affordable, and that is part of being smart. It's not about technology, and it's not about sensors. Thank you. The lady in the third row there, thank you. Okay, just tell us where you're from, please. Mm -hmm. Hi, good morning. I cannot say in English. Um, uh, I'm from Saudi Arabia. 
We have different uh, and very special situation. We have Mecca and Al Medina. Uh, we um, we welcome uh, Hajj, uh, Hajjis, uh, one time uh, in a year. And this cause a uh, yani, very specific uh, situation for the two uh, cities. Uh, especially, uh, we have uh, a, a great ex, um, ex, um, extension for the two holy mosques. And this caused the, uh, the country to, um, to take off lots of buildings in, uh, uh, in the two cities. And this uh, also يعني, lead to uh, many people left their, uh, their houses and also lead to the, the high price of, uh, of houses in other, uh, in other uh, ways or other, uh, other regions. So how we can uh, move to uh, the concept of the smart city for the two cities of Saudi Arabia? Uh, again, I think uh, Saudi Arabia has, uh, is in a very special position. And as you mentioned, the Hajj brings a very interesting twist into the dynamics of the future of the city, talking about transportation and parking and, and moving and controlling and security and, and crowd management and so on. And we know already that a lot of technology is being applied there. And in the future cities, when we see this growth that was mentioned, and what I referred before, the issue of the numbers and the complexity that the numbers bring. I also give you another example, is that now when we have any conflict in the region and we have a refugee situation, we're not talking about tens of thousands anymore. We're talking the order of millions. I could tell you about Lebanon. Lebanon is four million population. In one year, we are hosting now 1.6 million refugees over the duration of one year. This is equivalent to what? quarter of a billion moving into China in the duration of one year. So what do we do when we have a big influx or excess of population from regions? How is that managed? What's the impact on the local population? Whether the increase in the, in the real estate or resource consumption or environmental impact or impact on the heritage site itself what is the degradation of the site itself because you have millions of people coming in and out of that site. All of this, if we do not deploy technology first to document and then to actually uh, improve the services and manage the services better, we will not be able to sustain this. Neither the heritage conservation is what I call, neither the environmental nor the social. And this is detrimental implication and this will have uh, a cascading effect, whether in a refugee context or in the context of the special context of Saudi Arabia. This will have a cascading effect and this negative impact will flow down the line to other regions in the country if it is not managed properly or if it's not contained properly through technology and, and other means. Thanks, Imad. Okay, we've got a few minutes left. So one more question and then we'll have to close. Yeah, Mr. Menon, you spoke about the, uh, the project that you're handling in Tanzania. Sorry, and could you give us your name and your affiliation, yeah, sorry, please? Sorry, from you're... Gulf News. Uh, you spoke about the project of connecting doctors from India and Tanzania. Uh, wouldn't, it, as in, wouldn't it be a challenge for you to probably, uh, uh, probably to generate revenues out of this business model? And uh, secondly, uh, wouldn't wouldn't be you trading a fine line between a CSR project and as far as a business, uh, as far as the business goes? Uh, this is um, an important point. In our experience, um, too often, too many of these things have been taken off on a CSR and on a pilot basis without thinking about scaling. And when you don't think in terms of scaling, you have a lot of pilots, and they don't go anywhere. And if you don't start with a business model on how you're going to scale it, the ecosystem, most of these are just science projects in many ways. So that's the first point, and that's one of the things we've, that's, we are very focused on that. To give the example, and I'll be more than happy to provide you with more details on this project in Tanzania. Uh, and again, you know, it did start out with the CSR, don't misunderstand it. Just like the E-PESA e e money, PESA, right, E-PESA. In, uh, uh, yeah. The Vodafone project started as CSR, but now more than 50% of, of in Kenya and, and, and the regions is done on mobile banking. It starts as CSR, but somebody figured out a way to make it work and profitable. 
This is a Yale professor who returned back to India and said, I want to do something different and created a digital platform to do it. She now has a company that is already, and I won't mention it publicly what his valuation are, but trust me, she is going to be an extraordinary wealthy person. Because she was able to take that platform and do this, but allowed you to have scale. See, at the end of the day, in solutions of technology, if you don't think in terms of scale, you're not gonna, the reason why you're able to get Google and everything else free is because they thought of it at scale. The more people sit on the platform, the more people use it, the lower the cost per individual. So here she had scale, so she was able to do things for Tanzania, and yet she was able to do things in America that subsidized a lot of the stuff that she was already putting on the platform. So she's one of the largest virtual health, telehealth company in America now. I think ranked number one. So Thank you. that's the key. Thank you Otherwise you are right, it's CSR. Nothing wrong with it, but it's not a scale. Well, I hope you found this session as interesting as I have. Um, we have time to, we have to go now, unfortunately. Our panelists have uh, lots of brainstorming to do. We're relying on them to generate even more insights over the coming days. I'd like to thank uh, my esteemed panelists for joining us here today, and thank you all for joining us. And we'll have another press conference in half an hour's time on the outlook on the global agenda. Hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much.